Hi there and welcome to Where's the Money Gone, a podcast about football finance, governance and politics with me, Adrian Goldberg. I'm an investigative journalist, West Bromwich Albion season ticket holder and joined as usual by Charlton Athletics Chief Executive Charlie Methven. Charlie was formerly a director of Sunderland, he's a boyhood Oxford United fan and has given professional advice to both Arsenal and Spurs. This week, we're going to be discussing Manchester City versus the Premier League. Before we do that, though, we've both been enjoying the international break to take in some non-league football. Where have you been, Charlie? Um, morning, Adrian. I yeah. spent yesterday at the mighty Folkestone Invicta, um, who were playing against a... Um, well, it was an interesting fixture against a team that you may or may not have heard of called Hashtag United. Um, and the game played out as a one-all draw with folks and having had a man sent off with 25 minutes to go. Um, it's one of our sort of, um, at, at Charleston, it's one of our sort of hinterland um, sort of non-league clubs. Um, and it was interesting talking to um, the ownership and the executives there about the challenges of running a club in non-league football. And uh, hashtag United, what a uh, uh, crowds funded club, crowdsourced the funding, do they via the internet? I've vaguely heard of them. Well, it's, it's not, I, I guess, maybe not quite since it's, it's more commercial thing than that. So it was founded as a YouTube vehicle um, and have effectively by YouTube influencers um, who already had quite good audiences from other sort of areas of their YouTube YouTuber life. Um, and they decided to form a football team and to create a lot of content, digital content around that football team. And um, and that uh, sort of has propelled them. The, 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 the revenues from that has propelled them up the non-league. So you now do get this interesting sort of scenario. You know, if they go up one more level from here um, to National League South of having a team that isn't really based on any town or any geographical location. Clearly, they do play somewhere, but they make a big thing of that's not that's not us. Um, we are a digital entity. And um, I actually spoke to their founders a couple of weeks ago about you know what the future held for them. That was that was very interesting. In fact, the whole YouTube football landscape deserves a, a closer look. Um, uh, perhaps perhaps a week or two from now, we've just done a um, at Charleston just announced a partnership with the biggest um, of the football YouTuber influence of a man called Mark Goldbridge, um, which is already playing out quite interestingly in commercial terms. Oh, definitely. I'm really up for that, actually. I think we ought to explore that. It sounds uh, right up my alley. I was at uh, Harrogate Town against Newport County. Go away with my mates once a year to remember our mutual friend Damien, who sadly passed away. And in his honour, we tend to go and watch a lower division football club in the international break. And the lovely town of Harrogate, which has so many great pubs to enjoy <laughs> it was a middling game of football i have to say but engrossing for all that and very happy to support non-league football look let's move to the other end of the financial spectrum in football and talk about manchester city who seem to be determined to take on the premier league over its profit and sustainability rules these are rules psr designed to ensure fair competition and prevent clubs going bust. Now, this week, details were published of the recent tribunal hearing into whether a proposed sponsorship of City by Etihad Airways was at a fair market value. This had to be independently assessed because it was regarded as what's called an associated party transaction, i.e. people on both sides of the deal were connected. City are owned by Sheikh Mansour, is a member of the Abu Dhabi World Family, and Etihad's parent company is the Abu Dhabi State. And the rules are designed to prevent clubs disguising a subsidy as a sponsorship deal, which would thus allow them to get around PSR rules. And the independent assessment said that the proposed deal was indeed too generous, and they ruled against City. But in a letter to the 19 other Premier League clubs, City nevertheless claimed victory because the tribunal also said that the rules on associated party transactions needed to be tweaked. So the Premier League planned to have a vote to tweak the rules, as the tribunal suggested, but City are warning that very expensive legal battles may follow if they go down that route. So what exactly is going on? 
bluntly, Charlie, a city trying to drive a coach and horses through profit and sustainability rules? Well, Adrian, um, as we've discussed many times on this podcast before, profit and sustainability rules are about to be abolished anyway. So um, I'm, I'm interested in all the football commentators who seem to have about as much knowledge of business and regulation as my four-year-old daughter getting very wound up about you know, how this could destroy PSR rules when PR rules are going anyway um, because of the UEFA SCRRs and the impending government regulator. Um, no, what this is about is about the big case, which is going on in the background. This is about the big case. And... On all sides, there is positioning going on for what might be the eventuality of that case. Let's remind ourselves, Man City are under investigation for alleged 115 breaches of rules running across um, sort of APT, Associated Party Transaction Rules, into correct financial reporting, into lack of communication at the right times to regulatory requests, all sorts of charges. If they are found guilty of all of those charges, the punishment will be of a Nuremberg level. Um, and Man City are aware of this, obviously. And not only are fighting that case, which is happening in secret at the moment at a location which nobody knows, and going in a way which nobody knows, but the result is expected in the next couple of months. They're not only fighting that case, but they're also fighting their potential defeat in that case. So in other words, if they are to be found guilty of substantial number of these rules, they need to actually make sure as far as possible that the rules themselves are so discredited and indeed maybe even potentially declared to be illegitimate or illegal, that, that, that their finding guilty on, you know, in terms of these rules becomes effectively a moot point because the law has decided that these rules don't really apply. Now, you're referring to a very specific associated party transaction, which is a very recent one. But the case that's under that's under sort of current consideration, or the 115 cases, date back 10, 15 years. I mean, we're going back a long, long way. So in fighting this one and in fighting the previous case, which we'll discuss in a moment, um, against the Premier League in terms of the... Um, the entire underpinning of associated party transactions. So this particular case is about the sort of validity of this one transaction, previous one, of which the ruling was made um, last week, um, of course, was about the whether the entire philosophy of associated par party transaction was correct at all. And we'll come on to that one in a moment. So effectively, what you're seeing is all sorts of skirmishes going on around this main point. And indeed, um, some of the city's main rivals have served notice that they reserve their rights if City are found guilty to sue Man City um, as to effectively their losses which they have incurred because they would, if they had won those Premier League titles, let's say in the instance, in the unlikely in the potential instance that Man City are found guilty, and let's say that you are Liverpool and you say, well, during that time, we would have won three or four more Premier League titles. And the impact on of, of financial impact and the um, impact on us as a capital value over that time would have been absolutely enormous. Um, so there's all sorts of big stuff coming down the line. And what we're seeing here, as you often see when there's a big sort of a big battle impending in wars, is you're starting to see some pretty nasty skirmishes flare up as both sides test each other's weaknesses and test where each other are. OK, so profit and sustainability rules, as you say, we've discussed that on the podcast before. They are going. They will soon become redundant. But if City can challenge the historical associated party transaction rules on this particular case, which is about a proposed sponsorship by Etihad of Manchester City, if they can call the whole associated party transaction structure into doubt, then the 115 charges that they're facing from the Premier League, or at least some of those charges, they hope might be seen to seem to be null and void, and and that would help them in any subsequent defence should they be found guilty of any of these 115 charges. Which, of course, I should stress, they strenuously deny any wrongdoing in these. Exactly right. That's a, that's a it's a very fair summary. And I think what you're seeing here in the bigger picture, which has implications for the broader industry 
is you're, you're seeing the fracturing of Premier League unity. The Premier League's success, remarkable success as a commercial sporting entity, has been built over the last 30 years on an extraordinary degree of unity, where they agree effectively, well, we're going to compete against each other and we're going to try and beat the hell out of each other on the pitch. But away from the pitch, we're going to leave the running of our league to the executives of the Premier League. And that has been extraordinarily successful. Um, and sporting competitions, in a way, can it's very hard for them to exist without that um, sort of underpinning layer of trust. Um, because ultimately, if you do test all these things in the court of law, very often you'll find that there is some area of the law, the European Convention on Human Rights, or when we were in the European Union, some areas of Brussels law, which can effectively support one particular entity against another. But once that's then driven through to the courts, it, it effectively destroys the ability of the sporting competition's regulator or organiser to carry on doing that role, right? It just everything ends up in the lap of the courts and, and effectively instead of things being decided on the field, they get decided in courtrooms. Now, of course, with courtrooms, there are lengthy delays, all sorts of appeals, et cetera, et cetera. So you end up in a very un unedifying situation where really no one from one month to the next, one season's next, no one would really know who had won. So it's sort of a very troubling thing, I think, for the industry as a whole, that Man City seemed determined in their own defence to destroy the entire underpinnings of the actual competition itself and thence its potential commercial viability. In this row following the the APT ruling by the Premier League and City's insistence. They even sent out a letter to the 19 other Premier League clubs from their legal counsel, arguing that they had won, when I think it's fair to say most independent observers would say that they had lost on the main point, albeit that there were these couple of tweaks that were needed to the associated party transaction rules. In the aftermath of that, City have pointed out the huge cost to the Premier League and therefore to the clubs of fighting these legal battles. I think something like £45 million already has been spent. So they're appealing to owners' financial interest there in suggesting it's not worth the Premier League fighting such long and potentially very expensive legal battles. And it, it's interesting to me that they've had support in their challenge, effectively a challenge to the associated party transaction rules from some clubs in the Premier League, but not all of the clubs in the Premier League who you might expect to back them on this. There has been an interesting kind of fracture around who supports them and who doesn't. Well, that relates to some very complex and arcane individual matters. But what you say is absolutely right. In terms of that challenge, which Man City were very quick to rush out of press release saying that they had won, they did not. They lost. And they lost fairly comprehensively um, on all the matters of any substance. And it was a couple of very minor um, sort of matters of detail, which effectively um, the arbitrator effectively said, look, the Premier League, you're going to need to go and tighten up this or that, um, because as things currently stand, um, that doesn't quite work um, from a legal perspective. But really, fundamentally, the regulator, sorry, the, the, the court, the, the Court said that Man City's challenge to the basis of associated party transaction rules was ruled in the Premier League's favour. Now, what happens next is really interesting because effectively the one bit that they won on, and this is totally reasonable, by the way, and I think anyone could see the fairness in this, is that what was happening previously up until now is that whilst Man City were not allowed to effectively get fake sponsorship deals from Abu Dhabi entities. Um, other clubs were allowed to take interest-free shareholder loans and include them within the PSR rules, which, I mean, you know, a, an inflated um, commercial deal is surely preferable to an interest-free shareholder loan in terms of sustainability. So City correctly argued that that was totally unfair and demonstrated to agree how skewed the Premier League rules were against them. And I think that there is a measure of fairness in that. And one of the clubs that have benefited most from interest-free shareholder loans was Arsenal. So effectively, what's now going to be ruled is that in future, 
share interest free shareholder loans will be ruled to be outside the PSR rules. Um, but obviously, historically, not so. It was not to be applied in hindsight. In retrospect, the rules of the time said you could have interest free shareholder loans would be counted within PSR. So, or effectively, the, the, the way it actually works is the cost of the, what the interest would have been on those loans should have counted as a cost to the club. That's really the point of the situation. Um, yeah, because so if, that you was... make, if you make an interest-free shareholder loan, I mean, that's obviously not a commercial proposition. You couldn't be getting that money from the bank at zero interest. So, in effect, if your owner is giving you an interest-free loan, eventually at some point in the future that may have to be repaid but in the short to medium term that could be seen as some kind of backdoor subsidy and so the Premier League are saying okay we accept that bit of the argument and we will tweak the rules to make sure that those interest-free loans are actually counted against profit and sustainability. That's correct. Now, an unlikely and unholy alliance then gangs up to say, no, 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 don't do that. Man City says, no, 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 don't do that, because they want to undermine the entire system. Of course, in theory, they want uh, interest-free shareholder loans to be ruled out. They don't really care. That's not really the point. The point for them is to destroy the whole system. So the Premier League making some minor amendments to the rules is not helping them, because effectively that brings the rules into line with the law which then means that when they then appeal any subsequent defeat in court, they can't say that the rules are illegal and so on and so forth. Blah, blah, blah. But then there are other clubs who have, who benefit and who need interest-free shareholder loans. Let's have a look at, for instance, Everton, who might say, well, we don't want those rules amended because we need interest-free shareholder loans. So <laughs> it's a sort of un unholy alliance of people who don't want to play by the rules um, saying to the Premier League, don't make your rules legal, please which is a very strange position to get yourself into as the member of um, of an organisation. They're, they're all shareholders of the Premier League, and they're saying, please, 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 to their own body, keep acting illegally. That's what you should do. It's quite <laughs> extraordinary. But that's where it's got... And, and when I said earlier on about the fracturing of the Premier League into very strange alliances of self-serving blocks... Right, so you don't necessarily have the obvious characters lined up on the on, on one side because, for instance, you know, Man City are fighting historic cases of APT associated par party transaction rules, sort of alleged breaches, but of course Newcastle are effectively barred from similar associated party transaction rules right now, so they are on. On sort of you know in a different place to where Man City are, but nonetheless don't want those rules to be applied going forward. Then you have let's say Arsenal, who have benefited historically from interest-free shareholder loans, but aren't doing so now going forward. So in their it's in their interest to have that rule now tightened up because they're not going to get punished retrospectively for it, so they're fine with that, and so on and so forth. And you end up this I said this very strange situation where this organisation that has been so united for so long is becoming a sort of, you know, sort of Game of Thrones, sort of warring tribes type way. But when, rather like in, in Game of Thrones, I'm sick of sort of ancient Scottish wars, various elements of both sides keep on jumping ships, the other one based on short-term tactical self-interest. I mean, it's all very unedifying. And further further evidence, if ever evidence were needed, that we desperately need a, a, a government regulator. Yeah, in case people miss the detail of this, in the recent case, the witnesses for the Premier League against Manchester City included some of the clubs who you might have expected to support them, clubs who were behind the Super League, the European Super League, like Manchester United, like Liverpool, like Arsenal, like Tottenham Hotspur. They were all against City and for the Premier League, as were Brighton and West Ham. Also in favour of the existing rules were Brentford, Bournemouth, Fulham and Wolves. But the BBC said that Chelsea, Newcastle and Everton acted as witnesses for Manchester City against the Premier League and its associated party transfer transaction rules. So my understanding is that when the vote comes to tweak the rules, to tighten the rules, particularly around these shareholder loans, the Premier League will need a 14 to 6 
majority. So City need to get five, sorry, six other clubs on board to oppose the change in the rules, which would effectively, I would suggest, destroy the rules as they currently stand. Do you think they might get those numbers? Um, I, I honestly don't know, because as I said, it's, it's become very strange with people jumping ship constant sort of very short notice based on very short term sort of self-interest, really. But the the big picture and where this becomes quite amusing in a way is that the Premier League itself um, and the commercial success of the Premier League is obviously vast and is the foundation of everything that they're fighting, really. Um, and that has been built by unity and by becoming as ruthlessly self-serving in the short term as these clubs now are, they are surely risking the future success of the Premier League because no sporting competition can survive without rules. Um, and once it becomes a free-for-all where the biggest bully in the classroom can do whatever it wants without any rules to constrain it, then effectively that sporting competition ceases to be an interesting sporting competition. And I think, you know, do I instinctively, I think there's a degree of ego about this. You said something quite interesting earlier on, Adrian, about how sort of, sort of pressures that executives at Man City might be under. And that having worked for and in Gulf states in the past, there is an element from on high of, you know, will no one rid me of this troublesome priest? Um, it's a a strange thing where very well paid Westerners um, who in theory of course in their own field are highly respected are not actually particularly on a human level respected by their overlords in the Middle East um, who regard them as simply paid underlings and if the message comes down from Mohammed bin Zayed in his office you must beat the Premier League then no amount of reasoning will change that because from Mohammed bin Zayed and his office's point of view, the Premier League is just some bootling, pathetic Western organisation to be crushed beneath the might of their oil money. Um, so any Westerner who works for them is just then deputed to go off and do that. Um, I'm not saying that that is what's happened, but I can definitely get a bit of a smell and a scent of it in terms of the lack of contextual understanding of the strategic damage to the organisation itself of trying to make it an organisation without rules, which is effectively what Man City are now doing. Mm. Uh, although City proved, didn't they, with their support for the breakaway European Super League, which, of course, would have been a self-selecting competition, and the 12 founder members, including Manchester City, would have been unable to be relegated, would never be eligible for relegation from the ESL. Those clubs showed scant regard, really, for the Premier League. I mean, my reading of the European Super League was that given that you are had this come about, and of course we should stress that all six English clubs very quickly retreated in the face of fan hostility, but the idea of the ESL was that you are guaranteed a place in this very prestigious and lucrative European competition. So it seemed to me that the temptation then would have always been to field a weakened team in the Premier League. The Premier League, I'm not saying it would have been completely irrelevant, but it would always have been secondary to the more prestigious and more lucrative ESL. So some of me wonders whether... Oh, they... no, 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 Adrian. The, the, no, the, the Premier League would have ceased to exist. No, I mean, under the Super League, the, the Premier League would no longer have, have been a thing. Um I mean, officially, the, that's not the case, Charlie. The, well, the, but I know, but the, the reality of the reality. So let's just play down the chain reaction of what would have happened, right? So, big six say we are going to go and form our own league, and we are going to play. I can't remember the number of fixtures, but a lot, a lot, right? Um, and they're going to be played at prime times because the only way, the entire point of this was to enable the French, Italian, and Spanish clubs to make more money from. TV rights because currently they don't make enough money from TV rights which is why I never really understood why the English club wanted to do it because it all it was enabling <laughs> the other European clubs to catch up with them in terms of TV revenue but perhaps you know whatever reason but but though they would have eaten up all the prime slots um they would have then been banned from English competition definitely no doubt whatsoever they'd have been banned 
Um, and the Premier League effectively would have ceased to function because once you've taken the big six out of it, then its TV rights would become obviously hugely less valuable. And you'd have ended up as sure as night follows day with clubs in the Super League and then a reformed English Football League with the remainder um, in, in that competition. Um, well, just to clarify see- on that, there were 12 founder members of the ESL. There would then have been three additional founder members who had yet to be named, who would have been invited to become founder members. So 15 founder members. And then you'd ha- the idea was that you would have had five clubs who were admitted on a season-by-season basis on merit, depending on their performance. So if you think of 20 teams, home and away, that would have been a 38-team league. And I think you may well be right, Charlie, who am I to question your judgment on that? But even even, even the most generous interpretation, the one put forward by the, the founders of the ESL, clearly the Premier League would have become a bit like the FA Cup is, a bit of a secondary competition, had it survived where there would be no incentive for those clubs to field their strongest team because they wouldn't need to qualify for the next level of competition. Well, there would be no possibility, there would be no possibility for them to to field their strongest team because if they're playing 30 to 40 matches in the European Super League with the best one in the world, um, with those players also playing international matches on a regular basis as well, then you, you can't play a player, you know, three, four times a week. Um, so the Premier League would have ceased to exist. So there's no, in my mind, there's no question about that. It was an existential threat to the whole basis. The basis of the Premier League is built as follows. It's really important to understand this in this discussion. The Premier League is basically the, the animal and was created by the biggest clubs. Now, ironically, the biggest clubs back in those days included Everton, um, but leave that to one side. The same clubs who went on to try and create ESL were the same clubs who did create the Premier League. And basically, the other 14 clubs in the Premier League were only ever meant to be and intended to be well-compensated mate-weights who provided the backdrop of competition required in order to enable those big clubs to flourish and to out-compete their European um, opposition. I mean, it was created by people like David Dean, back in the late 80s, early 1990s. And it was strategically and structurally genius. Absolutely brilliant. And the strategic genius of it was the insight that in order to create the greatest football competition in the world, you'd have to give more money than would obviously be the case to the make-weights. The make-weights would need to be able to be competitive. And the big guys would actually grow a much bigger pie for them to share if they enable the make-weights to be more competitive. That was the genius of the whole thing. I think so that's once, a really interesting... Sorry, David, uh, uh, Charlie, to cut across you. That's a really interesting insight, isn't it? Because when we look at comparable leagues, uh, most obviously La Liga in Spain, where Real Madrid and Barcelona, in particular, a little bit Atletico as well, kind of garner virtually all of the TV revenue for themselves. Those clubs, from a selfish point of view, think, hey, that's brilliant, and it does allow them to compete, or at least in Barcelona's case, it did until recently, at, at top European level. And Real Madrid, obviously, fiercely competitive at top European level. But the fact that they hog all of the money means that La Liga actually is a much less compelling league, I would suggest, than the Premier League, for the reason that you identify. Premier that, League- that, that is borne out, that's borne out by TV revenues quite clearly. Um, so when the Premier League started, La Liga attracted much greater TV revenues than the Premier League or than the, than the English top division. Um, and now the English top division garners double the TV revenues of La Liga. So that is that is absolutely clearly the case. But as I said, effectively the Premier League was founded on a quite a sort of interesting stable coalition where the big six clubs were strategically sound enough to understand that their own interests were served by the underlying strength of the competition that they played in. Um, and that was going to require them to be disproportionately generous because let's not kid ourselves, these TV revenues are not generated by Bournemouth playing against Southampton. They are generated by Man City playing against Arsenal. Um, and therefore, that Man City and Arsenal will give away quite a large chunk of that revenue to Bournemouth and Southampton so that when Bournemouth and Southampton do play against Man City and Arsenal, they put up a decent game. And that then creates much more value for the TV rights. That then in turn creates a bigger audience. The bigger audience creates more value for, for commercial sponsorships and so on and so forth. And the whole thing goes round and round and round and round. As I said, it was genius in its device, but it depended 
on the strategic unity of the big six. They had to be together. They had to think together at the same time. And that is what Man City is fracturing right now. That is what they're tearing apart. And I think that that is coming down from a determination from the head of Abu Dhabi, effectively, we're not going to be beaten by some crummy little Western sports competition. We're one of the richest countries in the world. We, we can beat up anybody. We can do whatever we want. We're a dictatorship. And we can throw in those threats that you mentioned in terms of, oh, be very careful going to court against us. It will cost you a lot of money. You hear the note of the school ground bully, don't you? You hear yeah, that, Indeed you do. You, and, you, and you also hear the note of people who've got very, very deep pockets and can afford to fight as many legal battles as they need to fight for as long as they need to fight them. And whether the other Premier League club owners have got the appetite to fund legal battles in opposition to that is a moot point. I just want to divert into a kind of geopolitical point to finish, Charlie. I'm always fascinated by the geopolitics of this. And we've spoken on previous podcasts about the role that football plays in brandishing, uh, burnishing the image of the United Arab Emirates, in Manchester City's case, Abu Dhabi's part of the UAE, or in Saudi Arabia's case, in terms of Newcastle United. The digression here is that the Transport Secretary, Louise Haig, recently said that the company, the Dubai-owned company that runs P&O ferries in the UK, was a rogue operator after a fire and hire situation, fire and rehire situation a couple of years ago, which angered many trade unionists. They got rid of workers and then rehired them at lower rates of pay. Louise Haig said that they were a rogue operator. That then put into doubt a £1 billion investment into London Gateway by the owners of P&O Ferries, who were called DP World. And it reportedly then took a phone call from Downing Street to the owner of DP World to say that Downing Street, the Prime Minister, distances himself from what the Transport Secretary has said. So clearly the government says, we want this money in and we're willing to say whatever it takes in order to bring this investment in. We look at a football regulator and we ask the question then, Charlie, if push comes to shove and these very wealthy nation states like the UAE and like Saudi Arabia say, if we can't invest our money how we like in football, then that might call into doubt other investments that we make in the UK. And they've shown a willingness, certainly the UAE have shown a willingness in the past to threaten the UK government about investment if they don't do what they want. So is there a danger here that if we have a football regulator, they might actually end up siding with the oil states, with the money men? Well, um, that fascinating question to ask. And I, I mean, look, in, in its foundation, the football regulator will be independent of the government, um, appointed by the government, but after that point, independent of the government. Um, and, but we all know that the ability to fire whoever the regulator happens to be and rehire somebody who's perhaps more sympathetic to whatever cause the government might have is a significant one. Um, and so we shall see, I think, but it's, it's definitely... This, this is why this is why sovereign states should never own things like football because you don't want a sport, any sport, but particularly the national sport, being wrapped up in geopolitical considerations. It's just not. It's, it's you know it's not cricket, um, and is it, and is starting to cause, as you say, I think significant issues. If you remember the grounds really on which the Saudis were allowed to buy Newcastle was heavily influenced by government at the time. I think we all knew that. And that was a threat to do with inward investment, to do with oil, to do with all sorts of different, not just inward investment, but purchasing British arms, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's unedifying and I think sort of a sign that that, that, that move towards different types of ownerships of this kind might seem straightforward at the time and the assurances given of course are always no we'll be we'll have nothing to do with it we'll be totally hands off you know it's a totally separate body but in these countries that's never the case that is never the case I mean, even in as much as it 
sometimes isn't the case in this country. In those countries, absolutely it is not the case. So I, like you, have, you know, concerns and misgivings and can only hope that government can, you know, can stand up to bullies when it comes to things like the national sport. But when you see, you know, some of the stuff that's going on right now um, across government in terms of the ability of people to influence government in relatively small amounts of effort, um, the, the long-term determined effort of things like Saudi, the Saudis and Gulf oil states, you can see is going to be a problem down the track. Great to speak to you as always, Charlie. Thank you so much for your insight. Thanks also to Jed Thomas, who's helping with the production of this episode. And thanks to Mark Machado for doing socials at 1129 Media. If you want to read more about this stuff, you can check out my substack, adriangoldberg.substack.com. I've written about 10 chapters of my book, Where's the Money Gone? Currently slightly diverted by making a Radio 4 programme, but I will get round to it. Honestly, it's nearly there. Anyway, thank you so much for listening. Really appreciate it. If you've enjoyed these uh, this episode, do spread the word, subscribe, and uh, pass it on to a mate if you can. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again soon. Cheers now. Bye-bye. Thanks, Adrian.